Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we're doing the Pearson Excel International A Level, Biology Unit 2 for January 2023. Let us begin with the first question. Question 1. Plant stems contain phloem, sclerenchyma fibers and xylem vessels. The photograph shows part of a transverse section through the stem of a plant. So they say, label the photograph to show the position of the phloem, sclerenchyma fibers and the xylem vessels. These are the xylem vessels, these are the phloem, and that is the sclerenchyma. So next they say, how many of the following statements about phloem are correct? Connected to other cells by plasmodes matter. Transports water and organic solids. Translocation moves substances in phloem. These are all correct. Here we can agree that the solids that are transported in the phloem have to be dissolved, so there is going to be water there. So the answer here is going to be a D. In part B, the cells of the plants and prokaryotes have cell walls. Name a structure molecule in each type of cell wall. The cell wall contains cellulose and the prokaryotic cell wall contains the peptidoglycan, like bacteria cell wall. Next they say, explain how the arrangement of molecules contributes to the physical properties of the cell walls of sclerenchyma fibers. Sclerenchyma fibers have lignification and they're made out of microfibrils, so I said the microfibrils are arranged in layers creating a mesh-like structure. There are hemicelloses and the middle lamella for flexibility and strength. Lignin is added for secondary thickening to provide support as well as rigidity. So this brings us to the end of question one. Let's continue to question two. Question two. The photograph shows a type of plant called a liverwort. This plant grows in Costa Rica. Liverworts reproduce sexually with gametes and asexually with spores. The diagram shows the life cycle of a liverwort, which exists in two forms. The diploid form contains 64 chromosomes, and the haploid form contains 32 chromosomes. So basically, there is a sporophyte as well as a gametophyte. So here they say, complete the diagram to show the number of chromosomes in the female and the male gametes. So we can see if these are 64 and that is 32, this is going to be 32. And because they're fusing here to produce 64, that is also going to be 32. So 32, 32, two haploids come together to produce a diploid. And then they say, level the part of the diagram where meiosis would have occurred. Meiosis occurs here so that the diploid can be converted into haploid. So that is the location. Moving on. The diagram shows the nuclei in an ovule of a pollen tube in a flowering plant. So they say which letter labels the ovule. The ovule is going to be letter P. We can see that one there. And then which letter labels an egg cell. It's going to be letter T. Which letter labels a male nucleus. The first one is going to be the pollen tube nucleus. So U is going to be the male nucleus. And the answer here is D. Which letter labels a pollen nucleus. This is going to be what we see here, that one there, so it's going to be S. The next they say, describe the function of the tube nucleus. It controls the growth of the pollen tube, also controls the production of digestive enzymes in order to digest the tissues of the style to provide nutrients as well as a pathway for the tube to grow. So I said it controls the growth of the pollen tube, it produces or controls the production of digestive enzymes to break down the tissues of the style, for the pollen tube to grow and it allows the male nucleus to reach the ovary. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. Question three, the three domain system is used to classify organisms. Photograph A shows some cells in one type of algae as seen using one type of microscope. The cells of this organism contain chloroplasts. So we can see the chloroplasts and they say name the domain which would contain this organism. These are going to be eukarya. Chloroplasts are found in plants, so this is going to be eukarya. Then photograph B shows a chloroplast as seen using a different type of microscope. So they say, calculate the magnification of the chloroplast shown in photograph B. And they want you to give your answer to two significant figures. If the actual length of this is 1.5 micrometer, using your ruler or my ruler, I get 2.2 centimeters, so 1.5 corresponds to 2.2 centimeters. And that means if one centimeter is 10 power 4 micrometer, 
2.2 centimeters is going to be 2.2 .2 times 10 power 4 micrometer. So magnification should be this divide by that, which gave me 15000 if I round it off to two significant figures. So that is the magnification. Here they say, explain why the microscope used for photograph B shows more detail than the microscope used in photograph A. Based on the magnification, an electron microscope was used. So I said, because to generate photograph B, an electron microscope was used, so more structures can be distinguished because it has better resolution. Next they say, chloroplast contains starch. Which of the following is another structure that contains starch? Of course, it's going to be ameloplasts, and the answer is an A. Moving on. In part C, the cells from algae contain some structures that are characteristic of animal cells. The photograph shows one of these structures. The structure has the same function in algal cells as in an animal cell. Give the name and function of this structure. This structure is a centriole, and then the function it forms spindle fibers to help separate the chromosomes during cell division. So this brings us to the end of question three. Let's continue to question four. Question four. A pike is a fish found in freshwater rivers. The photograph shows a male and a female pike. So down here they say, female pikes lay egg cells on the leaves of river plants. Male pikes then release sperm cells that will fertilize the egg cell. An unfertilized egg cell is 2.3 millimeters in diameter. We want you to calculate the volume of the egg cell using the formula, this one here. Now, this is the diameter divided by 2 to get the radius, which is that, and volume is going to be 4 over 3 times pi times the radius cubed. So I used the pi in my calculator and I got 6.4 millimeters cubed, which is my answer here to one decimal point. The next I say, an unfertilized pike egg cell has a larger volume than a pike sperm cell. Explain why an egg cell has a larger volume than a sperm cell. Because it's going to receive the nucleus, it has all the organelles and everything, so it contains more organelles than the sperm cell. For example, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it contains more ribosomes. It also contains more lipids. It has more ATP synthesis to provide energy for metabolic reactions later on, so it should be larger in size. The photograph shows a cell from a blastocyst stage of development. The blastocyst cell was treated to show the stage of mitosis. So this is the cell from the blastocyst. They say which stage of mitosis is shown in this blastocyst cell. We can see the chromosomes are aligned around the metaphase plate. So we can say this is going to be metaphase. And down here they say, state how the blastocyst cell was treated to show the stage in mitosis. It was stained with a suitable dye to make sure that the chromosomes are visible. Moving on. A blastocyst evolves from a marula. Compare and contrast the structure of a marula with the structure of the blastocyst. So for similarities, both contain cells produced by mitotic cell division. So both contain diploid cells. Then for differences, the marula contains only totipotent stem cells, while the blastocyst contains pluripotent stem cells. Also, the morula is a solid ball of cells, while the blastocyst is a hollow ball of cells. So their structures are different. Moving on. Pike sperm cells begin swimming when they are released into water. A scientist investigated the speed of the sperm cell after they were released into water during February and March. The graph shows the results of this investigation. We see the mean speed of sperm on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis the time after the sperms were released into the water. Overall, there is more movement in March in comparison, or there is more speed in March in comparison to February. So they say describe the adaptations of a sperm cell to allow movement. It has a flagellum to rotate and propel in motion, and it has or it contains more mitochondria in the midpiece that is going to provide ATP to provide energy for this movement. And next they say, give two conclusions for this investigation. The longer these sperm spend in water, the lower the mean speed. So I say, the longer the time after releasing sperm into the water, the lower the speed. The sperm speed is greater in March than in February. So this brings us to the end of question four. Let's continue to question five. Question five, a new type of bacteria was discovered in Greenland in 2008. 
it had survived for more than 120,000 years in the ice of a glacier. The photograph shows this type of bacteria as seen using an electron microscope. So they say this type of bacteria can survive in low temperatures and low oxygen levels. Describe how scientists could determine that this is a new type of bacteria. Of course, this is going to be appearance using a microscope. You see the appearance as well as observing their biological molecules. So analysis of the outer appearance of the cell, as you observe using a microscope, and analysis of the biological molecules like proteins for similarities and differences with the already existing bacteria. Moving on. Bacterial growth and survival can be affected by changing conditions. The effect of temperature and desiccation, meaning removal of water on different bacteria was investigated. Graph 1 shows the effect of temperature on the growth rate of bacteria A and bacteria B. So we can see for bacteria A, the higher the temperature, the higher the growth rate until the optimum, and then it decreases. The same thing here, the higher the temperature, the higher the growth rate until the optimum, and then it decreases. Bacteria A has a lower optimum than bacteria B. The growth rate of bacteria B is higher than that of bacteria A. So in graph 2, they say graph 2 shows the percentage survival of bacteria C and the mutated bacteria C after water was removed from the surrounding. So on the vertical axis, we have the percentage survival. And on the horizontal axis, we have days after water was removed. So the mutated one, the survival decreases greatly until it's zero. But for the bacteria that is not mutated or just bacteria C, the survival decreases, but not as great, although there is some overlap in the error bars. So here they say, explain the changes in growth rate and percentage survival of this bacteria. Use the information in the graphs and your own knowledge to support your answer. So I have already gone through the graphs, so I'm just going to read here. The growth rate of bacteria B is higher than that of bacteria A. I've already explained that while we looked at the graph. Then for both bacteria, growth rate increases until the optimum and then decreases. And the optimum temperature for A was 10 degrees, while that for B was about 94 degrees. This is higher because bacteria B has thermostable proteins or proteins that do not break down easily at high temperature. The growth rate increases because as temperature increases, the kinetic energy increases so more collisions between the enzyme and the substrate occur and the rate of reaction increases. This is using your own knowledge and this always earns you a mark when you're talking about rate of reaction and enzyme activity. So beyond the optimum temperature, the enzymes are denatured and the growth rate slows down. We also observed that the mutated bacteria C had a lower percentage survival after water was removed than the unmutated one. So this is again your theory. This should be too. The mutation leads to altered membranes and capsule proteins and this changes the cell structure when excess water loss occurs. So the cytoplasm dries out, water for hydrolysis reactions is not available, and then the cell dies. So this brings us to the end of question five. Let's continue to question six. Question six, the photograph shows a Hawaiian parakeet flower. So they said the antimicrobial properties of an extract from this plant were investigated. Three sets of agar plates were poured. Each set had a different type of bacteria spread over the surface of the agar. Discs containing different concentrations of this extract were placed onto the plate, as shown in the diagram, and this place were then incubated for 24 hours at 25 degrees. So we can see the zone of inhibition. We can see the 50 microgram per centimeter. This is the highest concentration. And then we see 25 microgram per centimeter, and then the 0 microgram per centimeter. With 0, there is no zone of inhibition, while a smaller zone of inhibition exists at 25 microgram and the greatest zone of inhibition exists at 50 microgram per centimeter cubed. So the higher the concentration, the higher the antimicrobial properties. So here they say, the diameter of the zone of inhibition was measured, and the table shows the results of this investigation. So the higher the concentration, the greater the diameter of the zone, or the greater the mean diameter of the zone for all three types of bacteria. So here they say comment on the antimicrobial properties of this extract. Of course, the plant extract was effective for all three types of bacteria species. The higher the concentration of the extract, the higher the effectiveness. And the extract was most effective against bacteria A 
and least effective against bacteria B. So bacteria around the disc were prevented from growing or they were killed. These are the three points that could earn you three marks. Moving on. In part B, a new pain-killing drug, drug A, has been developed from another species or plant. This drug has been tested as a treatment for headaches. The effect of this drug on the duration of headaches in volunteers was compared with drug B, a standard treatment for headaches. My graph shows the results of the investigation. We have the mean duration of the headaches, as well as the concentration of drug. As the concentration of the drug increases, the mean duration of the headaches decreases for all drugs, but we can see there is no information provided for drug B below 200 milligrams per kilogram. So they say evaluate the results of this investigation. As the concentration of the drug increases, the mean duration of headaches decreases for both. And then the graph does not show data for the drug B for 50 milligram per kilogram as well as 100 milligram per kilogram. So drug B is tested over a very small range. Also, we see there is overlap. You can see here, there is overlap for the same concentration among different drugs. So the results may not be valid. Overlap exists here in the error bars. So drug A is more effective at reducing the duration of the headaches because you can see overall, it had the lowest value at the end. Then error bars do overlap. So it is difficult to know which drug is more effective. We're talking about at the same concentration, they do overlap. Also, there is no information given about the sample size or the variables like age, gender, and so on. So validity of the results cannot be established. Drug A was then used in a three-phase drug trial. Compare and contrast phase two and phase three of a contemporary drug trial using drug A. The similarities are both of them will use a placebo and it's going to be double blind. Also, they will both test with patients who have headaches. The differences are in phase two, a drug is tested on a small number of people. It could be about 100 to 500. While in phase three, we test on a large number of people, about 1,000 to 3,000. Phase two aims to determine the effective dosage of the drug. While phase three is carried out to compare effectiveness of drug A and the existing best medication. So this brings us to the end of question six. Let's continue to question seven. Question seven, the photograph shows different varieties of eggplant fruits. So we have those here. And down here they say, the table shows the mass of eggplants imported by four countries in 2020. So the countries are Australia, France, Italy, and Slovenia, and the different masses that they imported. Then they say it is expected that the imports of eggplants by France would increase by 1.6 per year. They want you to calculate the expected mass of eggplants imported by France in 2023, and they want you to give your answer in the nearest whole number. So France imports in 2020, so 2023 will be three years later. I used a mathematical calculation, which is going to be whatever they imported this year into one plus the increase divided by 100 bracket, how are the number of years? So when I used my calculator and simplified, I got 55472, and that's the answer in tons. Moving on. In part B, this bacteria infects some varieties of eggplants. They say these bacteria reproduce in the xylem vessels and block them. This causes the disease bacteria wilt, which results in the death of the plant. The extent of bacterial disease can be recorded as the disease index. The greater the extent of disease, the larger the value of the disease index. So the diagram shows a healthy plant and a wilted plant. This one is healthy and that is wilted. So the scientists at the seed bank investigated the wilt percentage and the disease index of some eggplant varieties. So we can see varieties, we have A to D, the wilt percentages, uh, as we can see here. Then the disease indexes, as we can see, and the crop yield we see from high to low. And here they say the resistance of the plant variety was categorized based on its mean, which is DI value, as shown in the table. If their DI value is between that, we can say they are resistant. As you can see, this value here lies between here, so it's moderately susceptible. And this is 61.3, which is greater than 50, so it is susceptible, I put S. This is 89.2, also susceptible because it's greater than 50. And this is between this range, so we can say it's resistant. So next page. 
they say how many of the variety tested were categorized as susceptible to the bacteria. Again, if we go back, there are two that are susceptible, so the answer here is going to be two. The next they say seed banks contain the seeds of closely related wild plants. Explain how seed banks will prepare, store, and assess the viability of these seeds. So the seeds have to be cleaned and they'll be x rayed to check for viability and then they'll be dried. They will be treated with a safe antimicrobial in order not to kill the embryo inside, of course. And then they are stored at between negative 20 to negative 40 degrees. And later, these seeds are planted in order to grow plants. And then seeds will be collected from those plants and they'll be used as replacements. Moving on. So here they say, explain how scientists could breed a new high yielding variety of eggplants, which are resistant to the bacteria. And they want you to use the information in the tables to support your answer. So when we go back to the table, we can see the greatest yield is with this one here, so variety A, and the greatest resistance is going to be with this one here. So we're going to crossbreed between the two, and then we'll observe the offsprings and then cross them again. So we will crossbreed type A and type D plants, because from the table type A has the highest yield, and type D has the lowest disease index, which is the greatest disease resistance, and the lowest yield percentage. So offsprings of A and D will have the greatest yield and resistance. Then they will use stud books to record the crosses made. Then infect the offsprings with bacteria to check the resistance. And then repeat the crosses with the most resistant and high yielding varieties of the offsprings for generations to come. So this brings us to the end of question 7. Let's continue to question 8. Question 8. Arginase is an enzyme produced in liver cells. It breaks down arginine into urea and ornithine. A mutation in a gene called ARD1 can cause arginase deficiency, which can be fatal. The mutant allele is recessive. It is estimated that 1 in 300,000 to 1 million individuals have AD. It was suggested that this mutant allele arose in meiosis during prophase 1. Suggest how this mutant allele could be produced in prophase 1. Now we know in prophase 1, crossing over takes place, so there could be an error during crossing over. So the exchange of genetic material could have occurred at the wrong points or at the wrong place, so that could cause the problem we see. The next they say, if the incidence of AD was 1 in 300,000 and the population was that big, then 26,000 people would have AD. They want you to calculate how many people do not have a mutant allele for ARD1 and use the equation p squared plus 2pq plus q squared is equal to 1. Now 1 in 300,000, this is the allele frequency for the recessive, so q squared is going to be 1 over 300,000. Therefore q is going to be 1 over the square root of that. This is square root, 1 over the square root of that. And that means the answer is going to be this one here. Now when I go back to p plus q is equal to 1, p is equal to 1 minus q, so p is going to be 1 minus that which gave me 0 0.998174258181. This is my P, so P squared is that. Now, the number of people without the mutant allele are going to be P squared times the total population, which is going to be that times the total population. And my final answer was this, which is what we see here. Moving on. So here they say, one treatment for AD is messenger RNA therapy. In this therapy, People are given that messenger RNA molecules needed for arginase production. The messenger RNA used in this therapy is active messenger RNA. Active messenger RNA is produced by post-transcriptional changes to messenger RNA, which is pre-messenger RNA. They say give two differences between active and pre-messenger RNA. Pre-messenger RNA contains both introns as well as exons, while active messenger RNA only contains exons. And in active messenger RNA, these exons could be arranged in a different manner, or the order of arrangement of the bases in active messenger RNA could be different from how they were arranged in the pre-messenger RNA. Moving on. Here they say, another treatment method could be stem cell therapy using either embryonic stem cells or human-induced pluripotent stem cells. The human-induced pluripotent stem cells are sourced from skin cells from a person without AD, they want you to explain how a pluripotent stem cell 
could become a cell that synthesizes arginase. Here we're going to go through gene expression, epigenetic control, transcription factors, transcription occurs, and a specific protein is going to be produced, which is the enzyme. The pluripotent stem cells can differentiate into most types of cells, including the arginase producing liver cells. So gene expression occurs and some genes are switched off, while others are going to be switched on by epigenetic control. This could be through methylation as well as histone modification. The arginase producing gene is switched on and it is transcribed to produce messenger RNA. Then translation occurs and the protein arginase is produced. Moving on. Here they say, explain why society may support the use of human-induced pluripotent stem cells to treat patients with AD. Of course, these are ethical issues. No embryos are involved, so there is no harm. And there is going to be no rejection. And there is great potential benefit. So, because there is no harm to embryos since adult skin cells will be used, the treatment is permanent because the cells will permanently contain the gene and no more treatments are required. Also, the treatment only occurs in body cells and not gamete cells, so there is no worry for changes occurring to the gametes. There is also no risk of rejection because cells come from the patient. So this brings us to the end of question 8 as well as to the end of this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.